This is China. Here are glistening cosmopolitan cities. Great ports teeming with traffic. New apartment houses. Slick cafes. Factories to make everything a country needs. Here too are modern schools. Hospitals. And laboratories. This is China, but it's no longer Chinese. For seven years, it's been part of the Japanese Empire. This too is China. This is free China, where the fight against the Japs continues. Little has changed here since long before Columbus discovered America. These rice paddies have been irrigated this way for centuries. Wooden plow and water buffalo are almost as old as the land itself, where the eternal fight for food is as bitter and hard as the struggle against the invading enemy. Malaria, dysentery, and cholera plague the people. Into this primitive country, Americans came to fight with the most modern of weapons, air power. This is where General Chenault and the Flying Tigers of the 14th Air Force have forged one of the most amazing links in the chain of American air power that now stretches around the world and is strangling the Japanese Empire. The 14th fights a long way from America. To understand its achievements, you must consider its peculiar problems. Everything you see here, every piece of machinery, every American soldier, Every drop of gasoline and every bullet and bomb has been flown into China. Everything the 14th uses, from paper clips to blockbusters, comes from America over a supply line that's unbelievably difficult and complicated. To make it simple, we'll start from the docks of Calcutta and ignore the 10,000-mile convoy trip it takes to get there. Calcutta is the second city of the British Empire, a seaport whose docks should easily accommodate our shipping. From Calcutta, supplies travel 600 miles north to air bases in Assam. Here are acres of jeeps stored in a Calcutta park, all destined for China. Destined doesn't mean arrived. Warehouse facilities are jammed and the overflow lies in the open, exposed to burning sun in the dry season, drenched in torrential rains during the monsoon. All these vehicles and equipment await shipment north. But there's no single road to Assam. You use ox cart, truck, river barge, railroad, and air transport, and in no set system. What moves by rail today may be reduced to river barge tomorrow. These barges on the Brahmaputra River take 40 days for a single journey. The Assam Calcutta Railroad was not built for heavy traffic. In peacetime, it hauled the tea crop to the docks and carried planters' supplies back to Assam. Now it carries heavy supplies for British, Chinese, and American armies in Burma, in addition to materiel for the 14th in China. China waits for this equipment, but the equipment waits for freight cars, and waits, and waits. Ammunition rusts, and rubber hose rots while the 14th Air Force patches, and waits. Broad gauge track begins to disappear 180 miles north of Calcutta. The time-consuming transfer to narrow gauge trains begins. Not even a box of K-ration can be shipped from Calcutta to Assam in the same car. This electric crane can transfer heavy equipment. Unfortunately, it's the only one on the line, and a bottleneck. Five hours is the average time for 24 drums of gas to move from broad gauge to narrow gauge boxcars. Even tank cars have different capacities, and their contents have to be transferred. Here is the last inch of broad gauge track. Trucks are transferred here by laying planks between the cars and driving the trucks across from broad gauge to narrow gauge. That at least is simple, when there are no accidents or derailments. These ferries across the Brahmaputra are the last bottleneck along the line to Assam. One carries personnel and the other rolling stock. Cars are pushed aboard and in less than an hour are on the far bank. They unload again and are off to Chabua, 
300 miles away. 26 hours by the fastest passenger train and days by freight, if all goes well. At Chabua, things begin to pick up. The airport and its satellite fields is the great hub of activity in Opera Sam. Here, freight is unloaded, inspected, classified, and stored. But all China has to fight on these supplies. Only a fraction goes to the Flying Tigers. Here is the precious fluid for the 14th fighters and bombers. Here are the 300, 500, and 1,000 pounders that the Flying Tigers will deliver to the Japs. Everything that can be crammed inside the fuselage of a transport is flown across the hump to China. Even a primary trainer. The hump. 500 miles of the worst flying country in the world. Everything's been easy up to now. As you climb up off the field at Chapua, you can see the dead end of India sealed off by the 16,000 foot ridges of the Himalayas. You have to top these peaks to get to China. To the north are snow-covered Tibetan peaks, rising up to 25,000 feet. To the south are the Japs. Below, barren, frozen wastes and jungle-filled valleys inhabited by headhunters. There's no summer on the hump. Snow always crowns the peaks. Ice hangs heavy in the clouds. Black monsoon storms sweep up from India, screening the peaks and bringing terrific turbulence that has flipped fully loaded transports on their backs. The worst up and down drafts in the world slide around these slopes. Jap fighters from Burma prowl the hump, looking for easy game. There is heavy toll on freight for the 14th. Casualties among transport groups flying the hump are higher than many bomb groups sustained in combat. Many a cargo destined for China is rusting on these peaks. It's a tough job delivering the goods to China. Four hours of sweating it out each way, looking for Japs if it's clear, and taking your chances with the weather if it's not. Then finally, you break out over Lake Kunming, nestling in a broad valley 6,000 feet above sea level. Let down into the gateway to free China, the home of the 14th, and the back door to Tokyo. This is the end of the line for the hump pilot. He goes back to India for another load, and the 14th takes over. Kunming was the first base of the 14th. One of the first jobs of its pilots was to defend their airfields and keep the hump route open. Here are some of the men who did that job. They are the original Flying Tigers of the American Volunteer Group former Army, Navy, and Marine pilots who came to China as civilians on a strictly business deal. $500 a month salary and a $500 bonus for every Jap plane destroyed. In the five months after Pearl Harbor, they got 300 Jap planes and lost only 12 of their own pilots. From these original Flying Tigers, the newly organized 14th Air Force got planes, pilots, insignia, a commander, and a great tradition. The planes were battered P-40s, 30 caliber machine guns, museum pieces on any other front, but all they could get in China. But the pilots were battle-wise veterans who now joined the Air Force as majors. The commander was the retired army captain who led the Flying Tigers, now Brigadier General Claire Chenault. With this motley array of men and planes, he faced a ring of Japanese air bases from Upper Burma to Indochina, prepared to keep the aerial supply line over the hump open. Small wonder the Japs thought they could blast these Americans out of China. The stakes were high when they tried. If they knocked out the Air Force, they could close the hump. Without the hump, China would be cut off from the Allies and virtually out of the war.
Again and again, the Japs sent big formations of fighters and bombers against the American air bases around Kunming. Day after day, the red air raid warning balls went up, and the pilots scrambled for their shark-nosed fighters. bombers bored in. Shark's teeth flashed to attack with General Chennault's famous fighter tactics. losses were so heavy that the Japs were forced to give up their attacks. With the hump bases safe, General Chennault planned to move into East China and take the offensive. With the help of the Chinese, the 14th was free to kick open the back door to Tokyo a little wider. The first jump was 400 miles east from Kunming to the Hengyang Lujo line, with major fields at Hengyang, Lingling, Kuelin, and Lujo. 250 miles closer to the Japs were the staging fields of Suchuan, Kanjo, Namyang, and Nanning. 
From these new positions, American planes could attack the Japs along a wide arc from Shanghai to Saigon and as far east as the Philippines. Nowhere else in the world in the spring of 1943 could American air power strike so close to the heart of the Japanese empire. You are seeing a miracle. In less than three months, these people built a chain of airfields that could handle the biggest American bombers. They built them on the land that formerly raised their food. They built them by hand. Their pay was 20 cents and a bowl of rice a day, and the Japs the American planes would kill. As many as 90,000 people worked on a single field. From eight-year-old children, 80-year-old patriarchs. And women worked as hard as men. Each field posed a different problem. Here, rice paddies were drained. diverted from its course. Hills were leveled. These cones of earth measure the depth the workers dug and serve as the basis for their pay. These rocks were carried from a riverbed two miles away. The large rocks are laid by hand and form the runway foundation. Mortar of mud and water, called slurry, is mixed and poured over the foundation as binder. Stones are crushed and spread over the foundation to make the surface. More slurry is poured and the stones are covered with sand. Half ton rollers pack the stones. a ring of revetments and you have an airfield ready for action. The Chinese air raid warning net kept American planes from being caught on the ground. Chinese spotters, farmers, soldiers, magistrates, covered all territory between our bases and the Japs. They flashed word of enemy air movements by telephone and radio. If a Jap bomber warmed up on a Canton airfield, word often reached this fighter control cave at Kuei Lin before the plane could take off. The net also guided lost planes. And Chinese guerrillas saved many American pilots and crews who had to bail out behind the Jap lines. No American stood guard, cooked, or carried. They built our quarters and did our housekeeping.
Many Chinese with technical training joined the ground crews and helped keep American planes and equipment working. New American planes reinforced the battered P-40s and the dozen B-25s that were the bomber command. Long-range B-24s, cannon-carrying B-25s, and some P-51s. The American squadrons were joined by pilots and crews of the Chinese-American wing. These Chinese airmen had been trained in America and now returned to their own country, ready for revenge. But the 14th was still the smallest American Air Force and lived on a starvation diet of supplies. It took almost all the increasing hump tonnage to keep the new planes supplied with gas, bombs, and bullets. B-24s supplied themselves, flying four supply missions across the hump for every combat mission they flew against the Japs. This plane would be junked in any other theater. In China, it is patched with parts from other wrecks and sent back to fight again. There is firefighting equipment that would have saved the life of this pilot. But it would have displaced a thousand pound bomb or 200 gallons of gas in the precious hump tonnage. These are the grim choices the 14th has to make. This is the hard way to refuel. Modern gas trucks and pumps couldn't squeeze through the hump bottleneck. Gas for motor fuel is diluted with 75% alcohol made in China. It's hard on the motors, but it saves hump tonnage. All this gas meant scores of dangerous hump trips and took weeks to accumulate. All of it was burned up in a single mission of one heavy bomb group. This was also burned in a single mission, a Jap mission. 15,000 gallons of gas and oil went up in this blaze. Jap night raiders hit a supply train at Lujo. Probably the best way to explain the shoestring on which the 14th operates is to realize that everything delivered to it over the hump during the first six months of 1944 could have been carried in five Liberty ships. New supply problems were created by the move to East China. High priority cargo still moved by air. But the bulk of supplies moving to eastern bases travel in another patchwork system of trucks. A rheumatic railroad. And these streamlined carriers. Christmas came late to East China. It was March when these Christmas packages from America and Santa Claus reached Quailin. The Flying Tigers had to do the most with the least. One bomb in China had to do the work of a dozen elsewhere. To do that, you go down low and ram it home. Like that. That was practice. By the fall of 1943, the 14th was punching the Japs from Indochina to Formosa. Shipping was the main target. The new bases brought the Japanese lifeline within easy range. This lifeline was the sea route from Japan through the Formosa Straits, down the South China Sea, the Dutch East Indies, and the Southwest Pacific. 
Oil, rubber, tin, and other raw materials moved north to Japan. Troops and supplies moved south to the Pacific fighting fronts. As the Navy moved westward across the Pacific, more and more Jap shipping was squeezed into the China Sea. The 14th's hunting grew better. Every type of plane the 14th had joined the attack on Jap shipping. Fighters dive bombed, skip bombed, and strafed. B-25s came in at mast height with cannon fire and bombs. B-24s bombed the ports from high level, smashing docks, shipyards, and warehouses. was one of the targets. Jap shipping losses mounted during the fall and winter. 40, 60, and 80,000 tons a month went down under the guns and bombs of the China-based planes. Specially equipped B-24s prowled the sea lanes at night with new tactics. In six months, they sank a ton of Jap shipping for every gallon and a half of gas they burned. This crew sank a Jap cruiser with only five 500-pound bombs and has accounted for 58,000 tons of merchant shipping. As a result of these attacks, the Japs realized that they had to drive the 14th out of China. Three times, they tried to knock the Americans out of their eastern bases. Here's where the first attack started. In the spring of 1943, the Japs drove south from the upper Yangtze. In the summer, they tried an air blitz. In the fall, they were back with another ground offensive around Tung Ting Lake. Each time, the combination of Chinese troops and American planes hurled them back with heavy losses. In the spring of 1944, came the Great East China Offensive. 200,000 Japs poured down from the Hankow Bulge. Another 50,000 pushed north from Canton to squeeze East China in a gigantic pincer. Their objective was to drive the 14th out of China, gain control of the Hankow Canton Railroad, and fortify the China coast against the threat of landings by the American forces pushing westward across the Pacific. The 14th attacked with every weapon in its arsenal. Despite bad weather, Fighters strafe troop columns with rockets, frag bombs, and machine guns. Many cavalry columns spearheading the drive were broken up by strafing and bombing. All this cost American blood, as well as gas, bombs, and sweat. Pilots flew three and four missions a day for weeks without end. These Jap prisoners taken at Heng Yang were thin and half starved. They said no rice and little ammunition had reached them for weeks because of air attacks. American bombers and transports dropped supplies to the Chinese garrison by parachute.
then the 14th ran out of gas. Some fields had no gas. Some had just enough for one more mission. At others, gas was pumped from bomber tanks to keep the fighters in the air. Before enough gas reached the advanced fields, the Japs had surged over Heng Yang, never again to be halted until they had split free China. The great retreat was on. One by one, the airfields that the Chinese had clawed out of their precious rice paddies with their hands were mined and made ready for destruction. The 14th fought a desperate delaying action. To the last, American pilots flew four and five missions a day, living in hostels stocked with gasoline never knowing when the order to apply the torch would come. General Chenault, Stilwell, and Vincent conferred at Quailin, issued orders to blow up the fields. All but a few combat crews were evacuated by air. Attempts were made to salvage all possible equipment and supplies, but much of the precious hump-hauled freight had to be burned to keep it from the Japs. Hostels and warehouses were burned to the ground. equipment flown in over the highest mountains in the world, burned like a funeral pyre. In the early morning, there was nothing left of a great American air base but scorched earth and the bitter taste of smoke in the air. The Chinese who lived in the city near the river set fire to their own shops and homes. What they could not carry on their backs, they burned. This was what they left to the Japs. Broken walls, streets full of ashes. When the town was completely destroyed, they blew up the bridge behind them. There were many cities like this in China. Some were burned by the Japs, some by the Chinese as they slowly retreated. After seven years of war, this was the face of China. On the last day, runways were blasted by 500,000 pound bombs. One by one, the bases were destroyed. Heng Yang, Ling Ling, Lin, and finally Lujo. The headquarters safe was removed. And the flag came down at Lujo on the afternoon of November 7th. Combat crews packed their luggage in B-25 bomb bays. Carrying 10 to 15 men, the Mitchells took off from Lujo for the last time. A few hours after these pictures were taken, the runways were destroyed. The Japs were only 20 miles away. In the wake of the Jap advance, a tide of homeless Chinese flowed along the long and bitter road to Kunming. Chaos and suffering defied description. When these pictures were taken, 80 trains waited to be routed westward from Lujo over a single track. 100,000 refugees jammed the railroad yards, waiting with their belongings for a train to carry them to the safety of the Quail Plateau. Sanitary conditions were horrible. They slept, ate, cooked, and washed as best they could. Doctors cholera epidemic if they were not moved quickly. Also waiting to be shipped were thousands of gallons of gasoline salvaged from the abandoned airfields. A few remaining guns of the Chinese army, American ammunition, tools from a machine shop, even railroad ties, all took precedence over the people. A captured Jap Zero was shipped back for intelligence examination. Meanwhile, the refugees clung to hope and waited. Some, considered lucky, fled by trucks, stinking charcoal burners. 
alcohol burners that had to be warmed and pushed to start. A truck carrying American belly tanks mingled with the mob. The road was lined with broken down trucks. Many were stripped of parts to keep others going. The only way to stop runaway trucks without brakes was to run them off the road, where many of them stayed along with the equipment they carried. Most of the homeless horde inched their way on foot, with all their belongings in the bags dangling from poles. Beaten and weary Chinese soldiers mingled with the civilians, many of them without either rifles or shoes. They carried sick and wounded on bamboo stretches. Farmers and soldiers combined to carry much of the rice harvest beyond the reach of the enemy. Jap 5th columnists helped spread panic. All over eastern China, these scenes were repeated throughout the blistering summer and wet, muddy fall. Here was a people again uprooted, repeating the scenes of seven long and horrible years of war. These refugees had long been a favorite target for Japanese pilots. But during this long trek, Jap airmen declined to venture into American-held sky by day. No Chinese were killed by strafing or day bombing. General Chenault ordered special fighter patrols over railroad yards and other congested areas when Jap air attacks seemed imminent. None came. Prices rose to 500% of the already inflated values as food and shelter became scarcer along the way. Tiny villages mushroomed into teeming cities of bamboo and banana leaf huts. As the road wound up into the Cuejo Plateau, some were literally on their last legs. Many of these people were captured by the advancing Japs. Others were waylaid by bandits in the hills. Along the road to Kunming, refugees streamed past new airfields that thousands of other Chinese were building to give General Chenault's flyers new springboards for attack. In Burma, crack Chinese divisions were loaded into transports and flown to the crumbling East China front. They had American artillery, bazookas, mortars, machine guns, and plenty of ammunition, and it proved they knew how to use them in driving the Japs out of North Burma. Colonel Luke Williamson's flying coolies rushed other fresh troops from Chongqing to the threatened area. The Japs were within 20 miles of cutting the Burma road in China and overrunning the new American fields when these veteran Chinese troops supported by air attack, hurled them back 60 miles off the Cuejo Plateau down into the valleys of East China. The Japs had started out in May to take the canton Hankow Railroad, occupy strategic coastal areas, and knock the 14th out of China. When they were checked in January, they had the railroad and the strategic areas, but they had failed to knock the 14th out of China. Even while they were fighting to clear China of the 14th, the Far Eastern Air Force and the Navy bombed the China coast from the Pacific. Their attacks were echoed by bombs from China-based planes hitting the same targets. The Japanese lifeline was caught in a vice of American air power stretching around the world. More supplies reached the 14th as the first convoys traveled the Lido Road, opening the first land supply route to China in three years. From new bases all over China, the Flying Tigers renewed their offensive, and the Japs well knew what the relatively few planes of the 14th on their China flank could do. This is what they have already done. Destroyed 2,000 small supply boats, and hundreds of locomotives, trains, vital bridges, supply dumps and barracks. Destroyed 2,500 Japanese planes. Killed 35,000 Jap troops. Sunk and damaged a million and three quarter tons of Jap merchant shipping. That was the work of the Flying Tigers. Work that is just beginning. <laughs>